And thirdly and finally, human beings will flourish and be truly happy when we discover joy in loving the infinite God and our neighbours in God. I started off by referring to the bush where the unsuspecting Moses encountered the divine and his priorities were wholly transformed. Here in North Belfast we also have many fires. Dotted over the city at certain times of the year in both communities are bonfires which give off the toxic fumes of heat rather than light. Given our history and fortress mindsets, while celebrating and commemorating the past, uh, they are also a danger to the environment, property and human well-being. They're not bonfires fueled by inclusiveness, respect and healing, but a means by which we pass on to succeeding generations the sins of the fathers. Human flourishing and true happiness is when, like Moses, the heart is captured by an affection beyond self to loving God and our neighbours more than anything else. Is it too much to hope that at least as much effort might go into creating an environment of inclusivity, inclusivity about bonfires as to, say, cake making? Here in this great city, we have alternative examples of light in the darkness. In some places, it's only small, it's only a flickering glow needing the wind of the Spirit to fan it fully into life. Fragile examples of hope, such as I've seen in Carn Money's new worshipping community at the Mac within the Cathedral Quarter, storehouses and trestle trusses ministry fighting food poverty in and through the provision of basic essentials of life, Wave Trauma Centre giving grassroots cross-community support to those who have experienced bereavement and injury through civil unrest. And the Nightlight Service that provides practical and practical support to young people lost, sad and vulnerable. These and a myriad of other ventures are shining stars in the night sky. In my own congregation, located at the edge of working and middle-class suburbia, its members, compelled by their experience of having been loved by God, sought to identify a need they could best meet in Jesus' name, which no one else could or would do. They set up a Saturday afternoon youth club for boys and girls with severe learning difficulties. Run by ordinary, loving, compassionate volunteers, it soon became widely known as a place of care and support of children and their parents, worn out and hassled. One Christmas, some ladies from our church's community lunch club had an idea. We can't go down on our knees and play with the children or manage a heavy wheelchair, but we can cook. And so they prepared and served a Christmas lunch. And while the regular volunteers looked after the kids, the mums and dads were down in another place, sat down in another place and ate a four-course dinner with all the trimmings. I couldn't help but notice tears dripping down the cheeks of one of the fathers. He apologised to me and explained, it's just that it's been 13 years since my wife and I have sat down to eat together like this. 13 years since you sat down to enjoy your Christmas dinner today, I replied. Uh, no, he replied. 13 years since we sat down to eat together. Human beings flourish and are truly happy when we discover joy in loving the infinite God and our neighbours in God. Andy Crouch of Christianity Today has observed that the Christian church is losing its temporal influence, influen influencing government, policy and power. This may indeed be the reality in our increasing secular, postmodern, post-truth world. But it's imperative that the church must not become bashful about giving voice to the pressing social and moral and public issues which affect many people both within and outside the community of faith. It's often forgotten or overlooked 
that churches together contribute massively to the social well-being of society, often plugging gaps in areas of real human need. Research by Jubilee Plus estimated that in financial terms alone, the contribution of church in the UK to the well-being of the community was worth £2.5 billion per year. The church's temporal influence may not be what it once was, but in the service of the Lord Jesus Christ, the challenge is to do what we were always meant to be, to be people of flourishing generosity, vulnerability and community. To be those who pray and point people beyond themselves to the divine. To be those who care for the vulnerable while recognising that we too are vulnerable. And be those who acknowledge that the common good is not only pursued individually but collectively and corporately.